I'm particularly delighted to, to be here um, as it is uh, Trustees Week, and actually particularly in Southwark. Southwark seems to do pretty well in terms of voluntary action. I was just looking at our register, uh, and there are 794 Southwark-based charities, and I think that must be higher, I'm sure, than other boroughs in London, and probably higher than any comparable area anywhere in the country, I suspect. And of course, I'm sure there are uh, bodies acting in Southwark that aren't necessarily registered from a Southwark address, but it's a pretty, pretty strong record, and I think if this turnout is anything to go by, uh, it's reflected in the turnout here uh, this morning. I'm also very impressed by the title you've chosen for this session, Thriving in a New World. I think we're all terribly inclined, given all the economic difficulties there have been in the last few years, to get a bit down in the mouth. And it's really important that we're using words like thriving and new rather than, you know, meeting the challenges of recession or whatever it is. Because uh, it's very important that people feel positive. And I think in every area of voluntary action, unless you've got trustees and volunteers and others feeling enthusiastic and positive about doing things, you're not going to get the results. So congratulations on that. And I'm sure the discussions today will reflect that. Um, this is the third year of uh, Trustees Week. Uh, I've only been in the Charity Commission two years, so I can't take any credit for the idea of Trustees Week. Um, though the Charity Commission has been pretty much at the heart of it with a number of other bodies. Uh, you know, for example, the Charity Trustee Networks, NCVO, Reach Volunteering, Charity Finance Group, and many others. Uh, and it really is something that's been taking off uh, gradually over the period and there are large numbers of events this week, 50 that we know of and I'm sure there are others uh, that we don't know of uh, and there's tremendous support from politicians for example uh, a lot in the media locally and indeed nationally some of you may have seen the Guardian's quite big spread uh, related to Trustees Week I think at the end of last week uh, so all of that's very encouraging and I don't think I need to say to this audience why Trustees Week and the focus on trustees is important. Um, I think it's going to be pretty evident to everybody uh, in this room. Uh, but I would say there are three things uh, that I think are very important uh, about it. One is, it's actually very important to find occasions to celebrate trusteeship. I mean, trusteeship, as Gordon said, is right at the heart uh, of the voluntary sector. Uh, and I think it's right that we celebrate the last count 945,000 trustees of charities in England and Wales on our register. So if you take the UK as a whole, it's going to be way over, way over the million mark. Uh, that's a lot of people and it's impressive. And these are overwhelmingly people who do a great deal of work uh, for certainly no financial return, hopefully uh, for a lot of return in other ways as well as the knowledge of the contribution uh, they're making to society more widely. One, the second reason that I think Trustees Week is important um, is that I think despite the fact that there are nearly a million people who are trustees, I think there's vast swathes of people around this country who would have contributions to make who aren't even aware of trusteeship, what it is, why it might be uh, important and valuable. Um, and I think it is fair to say that there is unbalanced trusteeship across the piece in terms of the profile of those who are uh, trustees. And the, the average age of trustees uh, that we've worked out from our register is 57 years old. When I look around this audience, I think you might be doing a bit better than that actually in terms of that average age coming down a bit. But average age of trustees is high and there are certainly particular areas where there's a lack of trustees. Um, we did a piece of research in 2010 and looking at 18 to 24 year olds who only made up at that stage 0.5% of the trustee body uh, uh, of registered charities, although they make up 12% of the population. Uh, so I think there is a huge untapped area uh, of interest and, and expertise. And that's a pity, you know, it's a pity for charities because there's expertise, interest, perspective to tap into. I sometimes think of it particularly when I'm you know, being one of the people who is bringing the average age of this meeting up beyond 57, yeah. uh, being more than that, I am conscious very much with young people that there are areas where I am very unfamiliar and very unconfident 
uh, where young people can help enormously. I think, for example, the development of social media and how to get messages out. They have that, a lot of young people have that just at their fingertips in a way people of my generation just don't. And I think, you know, that's just one example of it. And of course, the other side of the coin is, and I think one could say this particularly in a period uh, where employment prospects are looking so bleak for so many people, uh, that actually trusteeship and working on a voluntary basis with charities can be enormously positive and good for young people, whether they're waiting to try to find a job, want to build up something on their CV, and just in terms of feeling that they're making a valuable contribution to their community and to wider society. And I think that's a, that's a really important uh, element. And I'm pleased that you've got Alex Swallow here, and you'll be hearing from him, I think, later on, uh, the young, young charity trustees who's done a lot of work in this area. I think it's a really important one. Uh, third area I wanted to mention about the importance of it is to encourage charities and their existing trustee bodies to think hard about recruitment of trustees, how to get new trustees. I know this will come up later on uh, as well. Um, earlier this week we put out uh, the results of a survey. We've been gathering questionnaires from newly registered charities over the last 12-15 months. Uh, and in that time, over the 12-month period, we had 660 responses, uh, which is pretty good. I think if that says something, it's not, you know, we register 5,000 charities every year, so it's not a, you know, it's not a majority, but it's a 10% sample who did return this, looking at a number of things, but among them was the question about where they get their trustee groups from and how they go about getting them. Um, and... Uh, it was interesting that existing members or staff of an organisation that's, that's decided to apply for charitable status provide the biggest source, uh, this, that's 50, uh, 53%. 46% was about uh, personal networks. Uh, again, not very surprising, 39% word of mouth. Uh, only 10% say they'd advertised in any way for trustees for their organisation only 6% of those uh, in the press. Um, and I think that is an important uh, element to think about. Um, I think a lot of trustee bodies, and you can absolutely see why, and I wouldn't say it's not a matter of blame, but it's just a question of saying, saying to people starting up new bodies, or indeed for their bodies, rather than thinking, we've got to get a bunch of trustees, let's just pull in whoever we can find who's round and about and nearby and willing but actually maybe try to stay, take a step back and think, what do I really want on my trustee board? What skills do we need? What experiences do we need? And then try and go out and find those people. Now, it's not easy, um, but I'm, I'm absolutely confident that it, uh, that it repays if you do take a bit of trouble to do that. And certainly in my experience in trustee boards I've been on or a part of, if you do take the less easy option you do tend to get a better result uh, at the end of the day. Um, and uh, if you go to the Trustees Week website, there's actually also quite a lot of, I'm sure a lot of this will come up later today anyway, uh, quite a lot of contact points or signposting for organisations so on that can help widen the net uh, if, you're, if you're looking for trustees. And I think it's important to note, and incidentally the, the report we did, the survey with the 660 uh, responses, uh, is called Birth of a Charity, and that's on our website, so do take a look at it if you'd like. Um, competent trustees, again, I don't need to tell this audience, but it's incredibly important from our point of view as a regulator. Um, competent trustees uh, are of fundamental importance uh, to charities. It's increasingly clear uh, that the law places immense emphasis on the power and discretion of trustees. Uh, recent cases uh, decided by the Charity Tribunal, uh, Lord Hodgson's review of the 2006 Charities Act and our own new risk framework all reinforce a message that, say for very particular situations and cases where something's gone seriously wrong in a charity, trustees call the shots and that has implications uh, for the way in which charities should approach trustee recruitment, training and development. And it also has implications for the way trustees themselves approach their role. You've got a wide remit to make decisions for your charities 
uh, but in order to use those powers confidently, you do need to ensure that you're familiar with your charity's governing document, understand the law, and are scrupulous about good governance. Um, and in a sense, that's where the sort of first role of the Charity Commission comes in, because as the regulator, it's important that we give what assistance we can to trustees to understand what it is uh, they need to do. One of the things that I've uh, noticed since I've been in the Commission, and I think it's been said by a lot of people um, that I've come across, um, that actually the Commission does provide a lot of guidance. I think one of the worries is sometimes people think there's too much guidance, um, and sometimes a sense that it's not easy to navigate your way to that bit of the guidance that you really need to look at. And that's something uh, we're addressing at the moment in, uh, in two ways, particularly in relation to our web guidance, is to try to redesign to have, uh, you know, because there's always a dilemma, really, in this, because you'll get one group of people saying, you've got to do it really simple, top level, otherwise nobody's going to read it. And at the other hand, people say, well, I need to know the detail, and I want to be able to get to the detail. You've got to make sure it's there. And those two are sometimes in tension. So what I think we're looking to do, particularly using the web, is develop guidance which has really simple, uh, general top-level guidance, but with the option uh, to... Uh, to go through to, uh, to more detailed levels of guidance if that's what you need. And it's interesting when we do uh, produce uh, uh, things on our website that are easy to navigate, we also see uh, increasing use of the guidance. It was quite interesting to me, we did a, we're doing a major refresh of our website at the moment, hopefully to deliver that in April next year, but we did a sort of interim refresh of the landing page of our website in August uh, where we gave much more prominence to what we knew from traffic to the website were the most frequently accessed bits um, of guidance in terms of answers to, answers to questions. So we put the most frequently asked questions uh, centre and front of the website, and it was actually very interesting. The traffic to those frequently asked questions doubled in week one after we did it from 7,000 to 14,000 uh, hits, and that's sustained at the higher level since then. So I think it does demonstrate that if you can make it easier for people to go to find what they want to, then they'll stick with it and find it. And that remains a major challenge uh, to us. Um, further development of our guidance re remains a priority for us. Um, you know, as Gordon emphasised, you know, good governance uh, is all, I think, in the effectiveness uh, of charities and it's important for us to play our part in that. We're just about to start a consultation on some new guidance on trustee decision making. It will be quite high level um, uh, guidance, um, but it will join eventually once we've gone through that with the guidance that already is on the essential trustee uh, and hallmarks of an effective charity. It's also important to us, and this is an increasing priority, and that's another part of the reason why I'm delighted uh, uh, to be here today. We're working increasingly uh, with umbrella and infrastructure bodies across the sector um, to try to work collaboratively because one of the realities is you know, the Commission as a regulator isn't going to be able to answer every question that everybody's got. We can provide a framework of what people need to do in order to, to do good governance but it's a, kind of, it's a kind of minimum. What we can't answer questions is you know, what should I actually do in a given circumstance as a trustee and actually umbrella bodies, subsectoral umbrella, umbrella bodies of various kinds are much better placed than we will ever be to do that. So we need to support them and develop better partnerships with them to help them to provide a better service uh, to, their, uh, to their members. 